All right, let's talk about scaling security. Um, so this is a bit of a hybrid talk between a dot security talk and a dot scale uh, talk. So I'm going to focus more uh, on the scaling aspect of security today and less on the security principles themselves. So when I say scaling here in the terms of scaling security, I actually mean two types of scaling. Um, I think the obvious kind, and then for, for technologists, the obvious kind, and then the less obvious kind. So um, when I talk about scaling, I'm talking about both scaling uh, people, as people grow in your company, the number of engineers, the number of people consuming the software, um, managing the software, so on, as well as the, the applications themselves. And, and for the applications, it's also uh, not just the infrastructure required to launch the application, to run it, uh, to maintain it, but also the number of applications. A very common trend today is pretty much every company out there is just writing more applications. You don't just have one big web application anymore, or even if you do, there's usually a number of smaller ones helping to support that thing. Um, so in this view where you have both things growing, usually at the same time and hopefully very quickly for your organization, um, how do you maintain sort of a security, uh, a, a secure environment as well as a security mindedness about the whole thing? Um, so this is a very common pattern or anti-pattern, however you want to view it, but um, you know, you have the developers, they code, you have operators, they uh, are responsible for maintaining the, the, the infrastructure that the applications run on, and then you have the applications themselves uh, that have to uh, be de redeployed and changed and so on. Um, a very common word used today is DevOps, which is sort of the idea of trying to you know, make this more efficient. And maybe it's not DevOps, maybe it's something else for you. But I think there's a ger general abstract agreement um, that we're trying to make this faster by making developers and operators move together. And I think that as an industry, we've worked really hard to enable this via tooling and other processes for the past, I mean, it feels like, like a decade, basically. Um, and recently, I would say in the past two years, um, the, conversation that I, the conversations that I've been having um, with most people have kind of switched to where they figured this out or they, they at least see the path for how they're going to get here. And the conversations are now switching into security. How does security play into this whole thing? Um, for uh, the more forward thinkers, uh, security has always been a part of it and it's a very obvious thing. Um, but for still many, many organizations, it's, it's become an afterthought. And now, uh, since it's been so many years as an afterthought, afterthought, it's just at the front of the line of something we need to figure out. Um, the, a story that always stands out in my mind is when I talk to a company about how to get their deploys faster, and one of the um, higher up managers stepped in and said, no, we don't need faster deploys. Yes, our deploys take over a day, but it doesn't matter because it takes two months to update the firewall rules. So don't like don't worry about the deploys right now, and so it's like that's just the you know that's an effect of security just being in the back lowest priority for too long, and so it's really how do we solve the security problem, and to scale anything anything there's really only three things you could do you could do less of it and therefore do more as a result um, you could do that thing faster. Um, or you could do more of it in parallel. And all three of these things aren't mutually exclusive. There is some categories of things where you could do all three. But since we're talking about security, um, I argue that number one is just not possible. You can't really do less security unless you're willing to give up some security. Um, so then you're really stuck with the latter two. You want to be able to be secure. When I say do security, it's kind of a weird thing to say. But you want to be able to be secure um, faster, more efficiently. And you also want to allow more people to allow your organization to be secure. And that's what we're really going to talk about. So the question to scale security is really how do you empower more people to build secure systems? And I think this is interesting because this is more or less the question that when DevOps started becoming a word, like a noun that people used um, maybe like eight or nine years ago, it was about how do you empower more people to build, manage infrastructure, to be more responsible for production so there isn't this split mentality between developers building applications and operators being responsible for when they go down. Um, and that's really what people have worked on. And I think it's the same question we're asking now, which is how do you empower more people um, to take security into their own hands without compromising the organization. Um, it's very, very similar. So with this sort of core question of empowering security, the question becomes how. And 
the how is different for each type of person uh, in the pipeline. So using these broad categories of dev, ops, and security, whether those are very similar people to you or, or siloed people for your company, these are the general patterns that uh, we found are really important to hit. Uh, for developers, they just need a very powerful API. You give, you give developers an API and magical things happen. Um, you want developers to not have to be ultimate experts in a category. You want them to have the tools to build things. And so you're seeing really the power of this now where you have a lot of people doing machine learning and AI and we have .AI tomorrow, uh, but you see a lot of this happening and you're not getting experts in AI or machine learning. You're getting, I mean, very surface level individuals building recommender systems and things like that because we've gotten to the point where we could provide high level APIs and try to build things on top of that. And security is very similar. Um, for operators, they just want something that's not weird. I mean, if you give an operator something that behaves like anything else, then they're already kind of experts on it. And so what this means in the case of security is you want to get rid of the things like hardware requirements, specialized hardware, um, or at least make it uniform. Every, so every server has this you know, hardware component. Um, you want it to be pure software. You want it to be um, scalable in a very horizontal way. Um, traditionally, security software has been, here's your one big thing, scale it forever. Um, and you also want it to work on commodity hardware. Um, and that's a side effect of cloud just being the way you do things today. Um, all companies are deploying in a cloud of some sort um, or heading in that direction. And so having you know, a big iron piece of machinery uh, just doesn't work as a pitch anymore. Um, so that's what you want. And then security engineers, the people that spend their whole career, their whole lives, just trying to um, figure out how to protect an organization. You want to give them something that gives them the strict control they need. You want to also give them something that has a very clear model um, of both the threat model, the security model of what is protected, what's not protected, as well as a clear uh, technical architecture so they could understand how it works and how they could find, you know, try to find the weak points and lock that down. And so you have these three things. And if you do all three of these things, um, you kind of unlock the individuals to work on their own, and, and we'll get into that. Um, so HashiCorp has a piece of software called Vault. And some of the examples I'm going to give you are going to be revolved around Vault, but this isn't meant to be sort of a pitch for that software. Now, the ideas I'm trying to give you are more, more abstract and things that you could hold other software to um, as, as you look into it and try to build secure systems. Uh, but of course, all the things uh, I'm about to talk about are how Vault does it, just as a, as a baseline, uh, given I'm super familiar with it, um, of how we do this. So for developers, how do we give them that powerful API for security? Um, Vault gives an HTTP API, uh, JSON over HTTP over TLS API. This is super, super consumable by a developer. It's pretty much how any other API uh, today works out there. And that's in contrast to a lot of other software at the time when we're looking at that does encryption and things like that, that was SOAP APIs. I mean, they're totally usable, but because they're not normal today, uh, it was hurting adoption. Or more commonly, actually, we saw very much more bizarre un unstandard APIs where you would need you know, a key and you would SSH into a machine and you would do the commands over SSH. And th those are just hard things to integrate into an application. It's a lot to ask a developer of a web application to SSH into a machine to perform an encryption task or something. Um, so we provide a very standard API. And then below that, we provide three major features for developers. And Vault does a lot more than this, but these are like the major things that developers just want an answer to and don't want to have to think about. So one of them is secret storage. Just, I have some secret piece of information. Where do I put it? Like, do I write a file? Do I put it in the SQL database? I don't know. Like, where do I put it? Um, and what Vault says is, here's just an API. Send me the data, and here's the API. And we worry about how to store it. We worry about the keys with it, things like that. The other thing is encryption services. Um, this is a huge, huge problem in the US in particular. U the, the EU has actually pretty good laws and regulation around this. But um, in the US, it's very, very common to see a database. And it's like, OK, you hash the password. That's very nice. And maybe you salted it, hopefully. You know, like, good job. Um, but then everything else is like the address, the first name, last name, sec secret question for forgot your password. All this stuff is just plain text in various columns in the database. And it's like, why did you even hash the password? Who even, <laughs> who even cares? You could, if someone gets the database, maybe they don't get access to your system, but they just got enough social information to social hack pretty much any other system. So what's it matter? Um, 
And so stuff like that, which falls into the sensitive area, you know, you want to be able to encrypt it. And, and a common issue is that knowing at the time not only the best algorithm to use for encryption, but how to do proper key management and how do you rotate keys and how do you distribute keys um, and how do you track key usage. It, it's, you know, security has this turtle problem where every question just gives rise to another question of how you secured that answer to that question. And it just keeps going and going. And the people who love to dig up those turtles are the security engineers. So like what you want to give the developer something is something high level that says, just give it to me and then have the turtles solved by somebody else. And so for developers, that's an API that's send us your plain text. We send you back ciphertext, store that in the database. We maintain the keys and the rotation and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then the last thing is certificates. So um, thanks to sort of the rise of Let's Encrypt and things like that, um, it's very it's much more common today to hit a website and get a TLS or HTTPS connection um, versus a plain text connection. Um, however, it's still very difficult and less common internally to get encrypted TLS connections point to point between services. Um, and a, a big part of that is just it's hard to run um, a certificate authority. It's hard to handle certificate distribution. It's hard to handle validation, things like that. So what Vault gives you, again, is all over this JSON API, just an API for give me a certificate, please validate the certificate, et cetera, um, using Vault as that trusted third party. Uh, for oper operators, it's pure software. There's no hardware requirement. Um, it's stateless. So Vault itself seems like it has state, but actually what it does is delegates the state to anything else, pretty much. And so operators could say, we're experts at running highly available Postgres, or we're experts at running a console cluster, or whatever, Zookeeper, whatever, and they could just put the, the state in there. So Vault is just a stateless layer um, on top of some data store. Um, there's, it's highly available with active standby, uh, and you could get read scalability uh, by paying us. But um, <laughs> Uh, but it's all these things that are very, very comfortable for an operator. Uh, operators rarely see Vault and consider it uh, an odd thing to operate, except for basically one security aspect of it, which I just don't have time to get into. But for the, for the most part, it's just standard bits, right? You put the bits on the machine and, and start them up. And then for security engineers, um, it's this idea of Fort Knox. And I don't know if that translates well. Um, in Europe, I'm not sure. But there's this, there's a saying um, in security that's very common, which is put all your eggs in one basket and put that basket in Fort Knox. And the idea is that you want to centralize security because it's much better to very clearly understand and become um, an exceptional, have an exceptional understanding and become an expert on securing one location than it is to try to mirror that in multiple places. And so that's the approach Vault takes, which is it is a centralized place for all your secrets, and that's very scary. Um, but to help security engineers get past that, um, there's very clearly defined threat models, very clear defined architecture. Um, there's audits, audits built into the core of the system. Um, and you could build n-person tasks on top of anything, so one, um, one individual cannot uh, engage in an activity that puts you at risk. Um, it requires n people to make something happen, and so there has to be n complicit individuals, um, and so on. And these sorts of features are what a security engineer wants to see as they try to open up more flexibility to other people. Um, and here's like a diagram. I realize, oh, you can kind of see it. Um, but uh, here's like an architecture diagram we give you know, security engineers of how Vault works. And it's not like marketing material. You know, as, as one of the people who wrote this thing, it's really internally how it works. And that really helps these security engineers understand uh, and ask the questions. It's like, what if this? What if that? Which they're very good at coming up with. So then the question is, how do you scale it? So you have this, these features. We gave these features to devs, ops, security. And how do you actually scale it? So the end goal is to be able to do something like this. Um, in reality, what ends up happening is it's not that security is just doing security things at the bottom. Um, everybody has to have some mindfulness of security. And so in practice, the way we see this break down um, is, is this kind of thinking. Um, and I'll go bottom up. And so at the bottom, you have the security people. They, like I said, dedicate their careers to thinking about securing an organization. And they're thinking about the core security practices. Um, what algorithms are you allowed to use? Um, you must use TLS connections everywhere, um, that sort of stuff. They think about the processes. How do you uh, gain root access to a machine? How do you 
uh, what's the certificate hierarchy? What's the key hierarchy? Um, how do you become part of the organization's security council? Like they figure out all the processes and the minutia of security and the details. Um, and, and they also usually maintain like audit logs periodically, do audits, look at them, so on. And they're really dictating to the rest of the org this big picture, this big picture. They should not be reviewing every commit. They should not be reviewing potentially every release. It should really be a, a, a thing of trust where they're giving you the big picture and trusting the upper levels to adhere to that, but using Vault's access control and auditing as a way to double check. It's a trust but verify system. Um, then above that you have operators and they're maintaining infrastructure and building infrastructure. And so what they care about is actual infrastructure security. Um, what's the networking layout? Um, what servers could talk to each other? They're you know, and you cooperate with security with this and, and work together. Um, but also, you know, what ports could be accessed and where do apps need to go to talk to other apps of similar security profiles, um, that sort of stuff. And they're building all that layer. And then again, delegating responsibility further up the chain again in a trust but verify system. And so the trust is that you will follow these rules. The verify is that you'll check that infrastructure is there, but you're also, you know, not allowing certain communication, you're blocking certain ports or you're blocking non-TLS connections at the switch layer or something. There's a verify step in there. Um, so then at the top you have developers, and what you're giving developers is just guidelines for um, you need to encrypt all data that could be considered sensitive. It's up to you to understand what that means and use your best judgment of sensitive nature. Please encrypt it. Here's a high-level API. It's easy. Just do it. Um, um, use TLS connections to everything. Don't make plain text connections to anything. You're trusting developers to be able to do this. Um, and they're using their standard developer techniques of PR review and so on to do it. Um, I just realized I have slides to actually say all this, so I'm just going to skip those. Um, and so it's this, it's this method of trust but verify at every level. You need to release some level of control while knowing how you could double check that if you need to. It's not completely making it invisible and not your problem. Um, and this is really the only way to let this go. So going back to that original company that took two months to update the firewall rules, it's because developers were free to pretty much deploy and do whatever they wanted, but the issue is when it came time to go to production, the, the security team had to do a full review of that application and understand why it needed the ports it needed, why, who are you allowing traffic from, all that sort of stuff, and then update actually a giant Excel spreadsheet in order to allow this and make sure it doesn't violate any other rules. Um, and then let it through. And so there's this just huge bottleneck as they, they, they paralyzed dev and ops so well to make this fast deploy, fast app build process, and it all just centralized on security. Um, and actually today they've switched more to this, which is they embed security people on every team for the verify step. So app developers are responsible for it, but every N app teams actually has a security engineer that only focuses on those apps. Um, and they've been able to split it up and, and get a lot better parallelization to speed this whole process up. Um, and that's really how you grow sort of without compromising security uh, and you could scale security with your organization. So thank you.